All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us here this afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our seminar speaker, Dr. Ann Nielsen. Um, Ann is not a stranger to Blacksburg. She did her uh, bachelor's degree here um, in the late 1990s. So we, we overlapped partially. I was finishing up my PhD when, when Ann was a star biology undergrad that, that uh, she worked, actually she worked with three different entomology professors. I didn't realize Don Mullins, Rick Fell, and Ed Lewis, who was uh, worked in our turf, turf program. Um, but anyway, uh, after finishing, Ann did extremely well, got into entomology, obviously working in our department, um, and went, went to Rutgers and completed her PhD there. And the interesting thing there, if you look back, so raise your hand if you've heard of the brown marmorated stink bug. First, everybody, right? Well, there was a time not too long ago um, that no one had heard of it, at least no one in the U.S. except for maybe Ann and, and her advisor. Uh, she was the, the only grad student at the time that was working on this, this new invasive insect that had just come in and, and uh, did some tremendous work, laid the foundation, um, published four or five papers, and those were the only papers of this insect um, anywhere else other than uh, China at the time. So. It was a great thing to base, base her work on, and as Anne, you'll probably talk about wherever she went after that, finishing her, her PhD, and then uh, postdoc at Davis, that was her next move, right? postdoc in with, um, with Ed Lewis at Davis, the, the bug would show up, moves to Michigan State, doing some biological control work there, and then the bug would show up. Um, so, and then eventually she was hired back at Rutgers, and, and her alma mater is assistant professor, um, working in a research station in South Jersey at those tree fruit and uh, vegetables there. And the bug was there already waiting for her to come back. So anyway, she's done a tremendous job. She's a, a leader on our brown marmorated stink bug working group, and we're really happy to have you here, Ann. Thank you. I swear I didn't take it to California or Michigan. Um, although at the time, since we couldn't actually get funding for BMSB back in the 2008, uh, you know, we were kind of threatening to help it along, um, but we didn't do that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a couple, two, two main different strategies we've taken for developing what I would call system, uh, at least a, a, t a type of systems level management for brown marmorade stink bug. Um, Focusing primarily on tree fruit, I'm, I'm the tree fruit entomologist, uh, extension specialist at Rutgers at a research station that's about two hours south of main campus. Um, but this bug's the main reason why I have my job. Um, in fact, my dean said that I was going to eradicate it, um, so we had to have a little quick talk about invasion ecology and how that didn't work. <laughs> so before I begin, I want to take uh, some time to thank the various members of my lab. Um, this is just our lab group in 2014, and then my lab group in 2016, it, it shrunk on purpose, um, in part because we didn't have an organic project that we had to weed every day. Um, but these three people, uh, my technician, Ann Rucker, who has, I've known her since I was a graduate student, um, and she is absolutely amazing and runs all the day-to-day -day, um, operations. My PhD student, John Pote, who's overly enthusiastic here. Um, and then my former postdoc, Brett Blau, who is now a assistant professor in tree fruit at the University of Georgia. Um, so his primary responsibilities are in peaches. So hopefully we've got the <laughs> East Coast covered for, for peach production. So when, I, when I'm talking about a systems level approach, um, this is not a specific pest centric approach. Um, although in this case, we are focusing our efforts on a single uh, species for management, but we're hoping to also manage the other players in the system. And this allows us to integrate multiple tactics. Um, specifically, those tactics are going to be focused on integrating species biology and behavior, um, as well as a little bit of chemical ecology, but primarily biology and ecology, into our management programs, um, specifically our IPM programs, so that we can have a more balanced agroecosystem. Now, if you're familiar with New Jersey at all, um, most of our farms are, at least for tree fruit, are about 250, 500 acres. Um, primarily of tree fruit, um, but we do have a nice wood edge surrounding them. We have um, 
if you're familiar at all with New Jersey, you know that there's a lot of people who live there. Um, it's the most densely populated state in the U.S. per square mile. So we have this agro um, agro urban ecosystem that we have to contend with, and all of that is surrounded by either other specialty crops such as vegetables or uh, field crops. So while we're managing brown marmorate stink bug, we also need to bring into um, into play here the other arthropod pests within our system while reducing our environmental impacts <coughs> and then hoping that we can develop these management systems that also protect our beneficial insect services. So as I mentioned, I work in tree fruit, primarily peaches. Now New Jersey is actually fourth in the nation for our peach production that's valued at 35 million. Uh, Virginia is sixth in the nation for apple production valued at around 30, 31 million dollars. So these are really high value specialty crops that have very, very little uh, allowable levels for damage. Um, so they are intensively managed uh, ecosystems. Um, it's a perennial crop, which we can't rotate our crops out when we get a bad pest. Um, if we have a variety that's not doing well, we're kind of stuck with it for a decade or two. Um, so there's challenges and benefits to a perennial cropping system. The benefits are that we kind of for the most part, we're able to conserve our natural enemies and our, and our beneficial insects. They're important players in our system. Um, but we do have a very wide um, and diverse pest complex from our, our borers, our cecid moths. Uh, we have some scarab beetles, our June beetles, and Japanese beetles. Pollinators are really important here, both our native and managed pollinators. We get secondary pest outbreaks, such as San Jose scale and various uh, aphid pests as well as direct pests such as plum curculio, uh, tarnished plant bug, all of our moths, which are the worms in the apple or the peach, um, and our uh, more scale insects. So we have a lot of different contenders in the system, and we have to balance, um, if we manage this two, these, oops, sorry, if we manage some of these two extensively, then we flare up our secondary pests. Um, so we have to manage, uh, balance all of this together. Our key pests here are plum curculio, which is an early season pest. Uh, we have our oriental fruit moth or co and codling moth, which are those worms in the fruit. Uh, San Jose scale, which is a, also an invasive species uh, that's normally considered to be a secondary pest. And then we have our complex of cat-facing insects. So this includes our tarnished plant bug or liga species, our native stink bugs, and most recently, brown marmorate stink bug. We have a lot of different IPM tactics in our orchards. Um, this includes alternate row middle sprays, which is where we're spraying every other row of the orchard every week. Um, so for our insects that we have to manage season long, this is an approach to apply about 50% less uh, insecticide uh, than a full block spray. But it does require frequent insecticide applications. Uh, this is also what our pathologists will use for their, their um, pathogen applications as well. One of our keystone uh, IPM tax tactics is mating disruption. This is where uh, we use female sex pheromone and we saturate the orchard with uh, synthetic pheromone and basically it creates a large plume of pheromone that confuses the males and they can't find the females. They can't find the females. It works through two different mechanisms, but that's kind of the bo boilerplate of it. Um, if they can't find the females, the females can't mate and they can't lay the eggs that become the worms in the, in the fruit. Um, and even some research has shown that even just delaying mating by those females by three days can result in 75% less uh, pest injury in, in the orchard. So that we have mating disruption possible for oriental fruit moth in peaches, codling moth in apples, and all of our borer pests. And not surprisingly, when we use mating disruption, we have to use a lot less insecticides. And that results on the flip side that we have, um, we can conserve our natural enemies. So some studies have shown that both the, arthur, the beneficial insect in terms of parasitoids for oriental fruit moth, as well as the, um, the epigeal fauna, um, both see positive increases under, in mate, orchards that are under mating disruption. So this is another systems level tactic. It works better when all the neighbors cooperate. Um, research out of Michigan, Michigan State showed that when farmers, when they had an area-wide program, meaning multiple farmers on, on neighboring farms integrated mating disruption, it was much more effective than if you did it and you did it, even if it was under the same acreage, just because you get a, a larger impact of this. Another common tactic that we use uh, works with the insect's chemical and visual ecology. So we're using the cues that the insects perceive as a host, whether it's 
a fake apple for apple maggot. That looks like an apple to everybody, right? Um, or a trunk trap. Um, so that looks like a tree to an insect. Um, luckily, we can see better than they can. Um, we use this for plum curculio and apple maggot. Usually, these are baited with some sort of lore, such as an aggregation pheromone or a host plant volatile. And this can either be used for monitoring or for management if we want to use it in an attract and kill scenario. Um, and we can use a selective insecticides, of course, too. Now, another way to manage our insects is through ground cover management. We can add in flowering resources within row middles. Um, but this is a little bit controversial because you're adding a flower resource to an orchard that's sprayed heavily. Uh, so you could have some negative impacts on not only your natural enemies, but also on your foraging bees. Um, so you can add flowering resources outside of the orchard as well. We can remove one common thing that we do, or at least we used to do, was to remove our alternate host plants. Specifically, we managed our ground cover uh, by using an herbicide or maintaining a solid uh, turf row middle, so that's between the trees, uh, to remove uh, alternate host plants for ligus. So we're removing the white clover and that controls both our native stink bugs and, and ligus. Um, a behavioral tactic, this is what ligus does to uh, apple. It's very early on, it's just like a <coughs> stuck a needle into it. And by using this herbicide within the ground cover, we also can conserve our natural enemies. So these are kind of these alternate tactics that we've approached that stay away from broad spectrum insecticide applications. However, when stink bug came in, or brown marmorated stink bug specifically, this, this all changed. Uh, we started using uh, broad spectrum materials, specifically pyrethroids and neonicotinoids, uh, which of course have concerns with bee safety. Um, most of our other insecticides didn't work, and we were spraying on a weekly basis, season long. So upwards of 15, 20 insecticide applications. So you can imagine what that might do. Um, in terms of uh, a major perturbation to our agroecosystem. So Haliomorpha halis uh, is an invasive species that at least the East Coast population is believed to come from Beijing, China. It was first detected in the mid-1990s, um, although I started working on it in 2003, it was still very spotty, very low populations. Mm -hmm. It, of course, had a huge population outbreak in 2010. Um, where I've been heard it referred to as a biblical plague of stink bugs, um, and they are literally raining down from the trees. So it's currently present in 42 states and the District of Columbia. We used to always joke that it had to hit a certain White House before we could get funding, and that's about what happened. Um, this is also an urban nuisance. As most of you are probably familiar, it likes to overwinter where we do, inside human-made uh, human -made shelters. It does utilize uh, dead upright trees and rick, uh, rock outcroppings as well, um, but this association with urban and ag seems to really help promote it. It has over 170 host plants that have been identified just in the United States alone, so it's a highly prolificous pest. So can we look at its species ecology and see how some of these factors may have disrupted our IPM programs? So three factors that we like to attribute to a successful invas invasive species are uh, the ability to spread and adapt to its new environment, a uh, release from natural enemies, that's the enemy release hypothesis, and that it has to have a, um, it has to be an economic or ecological pest. Now, of course, that's a human, um, human derived term, but for Haliomorpha, we know that we, we have a system of black light traps within the state of New Jersey. And when we started going through those back in 2004, uh, we found that the proportion of farms uh, that were positive for BMSB throughout our state, that's about 60 to 80 black light traps, um, we found a 75% annual population increase. Um, so it was spreading to about three new farms a year um, relatively quickly. Now, this was during kind of the exponential growth phase uh, for an invasive species. So that's not that surprising. But we did see a strong association with urban areas. Now, that's most of New Jersey, um, but our urban areas are up here and then this whole area. And when we looked at the landscape level analysis of this pest, we saw a strong association with railways uh, and urban areas as well as agriculture. Now, invasive species are also typically, um, they're coming over here, you're just getting a subset of the population. And when you do that, when you're getting that subset of the population, you're getting only one or a very reduced uh, genetic haplotype. And that was true for Haliomorpha as well. Um, 
we found only two uh, mitochondrial haplotypes within the US as of 2008. We're currently updating this, um, but I'm not allowed to talk about the results of that yet. Um, but we, it did look like, at, that, at least as, as of 2008, that we had anywhere from two to 20 females <coughs> that were introduced um, and that caused this large population outbreak that we had. So whatever uh, population ALE effects that they went under during that genetic bottleneck, they've obviously been able to overcome and uh, have been quite successful in um, spreading and adapting to their new environment. Now, in terms of enemy release, we see very minimal levels of parasitism by the specialist egg parasitoids in our <laughs> agroecosystems. Now, that may change. Um, Trisulcus japonicus has also been found, and that's the co-evolved natural enemy, a par egg parasitoid of Halimorpha. That's also been found in the US, not in New Jersey. Um, they don't like us. But we otherwise, we're seeing generally low levels of predation, or at least we thought we were. Now, we have all these factors, the ability to spread really fast, the, the association with human habitats, a high uh, host breadth, and a high dispersal capacity. And this creates this landscape level uh, threat to crops. Now, this is from a Virginia farm, but this could very easily be from a farm in New Jersey, where we have not only tree of heaven, but we have native woody hosts along the borders of the, of the farm. We have a very diversified cropping system with, for us, peaches and apples. Uh, row crops, vegetables, uh, basically anything that the, this bug wants to feed on, it's going to be present within an agroecosystem um, in the mid-Atlantic states. Now, this has created quite uh, significant losses in terms of crops. This was uh, photos from 2010 where the peach orchards were decimated, and this particular uh, orchard has just abandoned his crop. In apples, we see something similar. You can see these darkened spots here. Um, that's a direct result of their feeding. If you cut similar fruit open, you can see these brown corky spots underneath. Um, not very appetizing. You might still be able to make juice out of it, but um, very considerable economic loss. In 2010 alone, this resulted in $37 million in losses just to mid-Atlantic apples. Um, in peaches, we had 60 to 90 percent losses in New Jersey. And even in 2013, after we initiated management programs, we still had 4 to 44 percent injury in peaches. And that's with very broad spectrum repeated insecticide applications. So this has caused a fourfold increase in our insecticides, um, which, as you may suspect, has resulted in some additional problems. So we have systems level impacts on our orchards. Not only are we spraying really early on in the season, we are um, spraying repeatedly. And this has caused significant outbreaks in our secondary pests. This, again, is San Jose scale. Uh, this is white peach scale. It covers the trees, but they will move to the fruit under high population pressure. And woolly apple aphid, which has been a focus of Chris Berg's research here at Virginia Tech. Um, so we're getting secondary pest outbreaks. We also get aphid uh, populations. And this is primarily because we're using a lot of pyrethroids in the system. And that harms the natural enemies. Um, and so the natural enemies are no longer able to uh, suppress those populations naturally. We've also abandoned all those beautiful IPM tactics that I talked about earlier. We abandoned incidence-based management, waiting for the bug to show up or using some trap-based threshold to initiate sprays. We abandoned reduced risk insecticides uh, in favor of broad-spectrum pyrethroids and some neonicotinoids, uh, even a couple carbamates. Our growers generally abandoned mating disruption because it's very expensive and they had to spray the orchard anyways. And those same chemicals also controlled, that controlled BMSB also generally controlled the, the moth pests that they were looking for. And we had no treatment threshold to work off of. So we have this, um, these impacts on our orchards, but we have to come back from this because that's not a very economically or um, ecologically sustainable mode to, to move upon. Now, in peaches, uh, BMSB, Halimorpha, is present throughout the growing season. Uh, these are our adult populations. You can see they vary from year to year. This is 2013, which was the highest year that we had on the farm as of yet. 2016 was pretty good, too. The nymphs are present um, for long periods and are present in very high numbers throughout the growing season as well. Peach is a very good reproductive host for uh, Halimorpha, and they can actually complete their life cycle on peach alone, uh, which is great. <laughs> um, they do also disperse into peaches very early in the season. So applying a degree day model we've developed 
um, they move into peaches at around 100 degree days. And these are immature females that are looking to mature their ovaries. So they're moving into peaches, they're, become, they're feeding and becoming reproductive. Those, their offspring then stay in the orchard throughout the entire growing season, causing damage. And work done um, by Angel um, Acebes Doria in Chris Berg's lab has shown that not only are peaches an excellent host, um, and the nymphs can develop on them, but the nymphs can also cause damage in peaches. So that brought us to our question of, okay, so we can't use mating disruption. Uh, at the time, the traps were a variable effectiveness. So what other methods can we use to start managing brown marmorade stink bug uh, to start bringing back some IPM tactics? So we wanted to look at how BMSB moves through the agroecosystem. Some work also done by Chris Berg's lab had shown that damage was higher on the edges of the orchards uh, in apples than it was on the interior. So with peaches, what we wanted to know is, do they have a strong edge effect? So this is one of my research plots. It's about a five acre, four and a half acre plot of peaches. It has field corn on one side, woods on one side, another variety block of peaches here, and apples. And what we did is we sprayed protein markers. So we sprayed, uh, let's see, egg is in the purple here on the outside of the orchard. Uh, the in, then there's a buffer zone in green. And then the interior of it is sprayed with milk protein. And what this allows us to do, it's a little different than a mark release recapture experiment. It's a mark recapture <laughs> experiment. So we're marking the bugs in the field without disturbing any of their behaviors and then going back and sampling them. Then we have to run an ELISA to test for the protein. And then all these dots here are places that we sampled. We've done this multiple times throughout the growing season. And what we find is that there's a very strong edge effect. So here in green is the total number of bugs that were recovered. Um, and then salmon color, maybe, whatever that is. Um, not quite maroon or orange. Um, that's the egg protein. And then blue is milk. And purple is that they were bar marked with both. So we can see that the ones in the middle were either unmarked or marked predominantly with egg. And then a little bit of these that are marked with both, which indicates they're moving back and forth. Now, unfortunately, we can't tell directionality. We don't know if they landed on the edge and then moved inwards, or if they were on the inside and moved outward. Um, it's one of the downsides to this technique. But we did see that we have about 62% of our bugs captured um, were positive for egg protein, which shows that they were present on the border, and 38% were captured on the interior. And this behavior persisted for seven days. So we would sample for seven days, and we found bugs that were still marked with the protein only, with the egg only, on the border for seven days, which means that not only are they stopping at the edge, that dispersal into peach is arresting their dispersal behavior, but they're staying. Now, what I think is interesting is that this behavior is driven primarily by the males. So when we look at all of the bugs that we captured, we captured significantly higher numbers on the border of the blocks than on the interior. Um, but when we look at this by, by sex, the females are equal, and it's the males that have significantly higher ones on the edge of the crop, which means that the females are the ones that are moving back and forth between the, um, the edge and the interior, and the males are the ones that are pretty much staying put. Now, this could be due to, um, for mating reasons, these, these bugs mate multiple times, and it could be that the males are staying put to wait for another mate to come along, and the females are dispersing their um, offspring throughout the orchard, and we're going to be looking at that this year. So now that we know we have a very strong perimeter-driven pest, can we develop a management program that exploits this behavioral, um, this behavioral ecology? So one thing when I started um, about, we started this project about a month after I started at, at Rutgers. Um, and one of my main goals was to bring back mating disruption uh, to our orchards. So we talked to some growers, and in coordination with uh, Dean Polk of our IPM program, we luckily got some growers um, together, and we, um, we put mating disruption out uh, for Oriole and a fruit moth. We've also done this in apples, but I'm only going to talk about peaches. And then we looked at our ground cover management again. We wanted to bring back this other IPM tactic. And then we applied a degree day model that I'd been working on for BMSB. So we stopped, we didn't start spraying until 100 degree days, which was a couple weeks after when our growers were initially starting. So that alone saved you know, two to three insecticide applications. And then we started doing 
border insecticide sprays. So we were just spraying the border of the orchard, not the trees on the outside, the peaches on, on the outside, uh, the peaches on the border. And we're still doing this at a weekly interval. Now, it's still intense, and we're hoping to improve this, um, but weekly was better than, um, bo weekly border sprays was better than what we were doing before. So if this is an example orchard, um, it's not that pretty normally. This, the blue part here is what we'd spray. We'd spray the edge, the border, plus the first full row under mating disruption. And we compared that to our grower standard, whatever they were doing. So um, two out of the three of the growers were doing alternate row middles. We tried to encourage the growers to use the same insecticide each week that they were using. Um, for the most part, they did that. And then we sampled at these, I think, 16, 17 different sampling sites on a weekly basis. We were looking for brown marmorate stink bug, uh, other cat facing injury, including our ligus, uh, as well as our moth, moth pests. And then we also put up sticky cards uh, a couple times during the year to monitor for natural enemies. And we harvested 50 fruit per sample, which is 850 fruit per block. This is one block, that's two, times three farms, times three years. We cut a lot of peaches in our lab. Um, but over three years, and we had very different population pressure uh, within each year. So the first two years, we didn't really see an effect of the ground cover management. This is for ligus. In 2014, we saw very high levels of ligus populations in our standard, which is always going to be in blue here, um, but l significantly lower levels of ligus in our IPM CPR blocks. Now, for Graphalita molesta, this is our oriental fruit moth. Now, these growers, um, the standards were using um, insecticide applications, whereas our IPM CPR blocks CPR, sorry, stands for IPM Crop Perimeter Restructuring. So we were trying to breathe life back into our IPM systems. That didn't go over so far so well when I went to Italy and was trying to explain this because they don't use the term CPR, um, but we thought it was funny. Um, entomology humor. So one thing that happens with mating disruption is that after three years, you get almost complete shutdown. Um, so and this worked. We saw very little difference or no difference at all in 2012. Now, these are really low levels of pressure for these pests, um, and that's part in part due to the really intensive management programs that we've had going on. Um, 2013, we had 100% clean fruit in our IPM CPR blocks. In 2014, no significant difference, but 100% no, no, um, clean fruit. So it's working for two pests, yay. Um, but those are kind of proven IPM tactics that we already knew about. Now, in terms of our cat facing injury, now stink bug injury is called cat facing. I don't know why, but somebody thought that a fruit that had been fed on looked like a cat, a very mangled cat. Um, so we call it cat facing. We can't distinguish brown marmorate stink bug from brown stink bug feeding damage. Um, some people will say they can, and maybe there's a little bit of truth to that, but we just call it cat facing damage. <laughs> now, 2012, if you remember from that earlier graph, was moderate damage, moderate population pressure. 2013 was our highest population pressure, and 2014 was, I'd say, lower, um, but we had a hailstorm at my farm, so I don't know what the pressure looked like everywhere else. Um, the first year, of course, we get excellent, beautiful, significant damage, significant differences between our standard and our IPM CPR block. I was hoping for equal levels of damage um, because we're only spraying 25% of the orchard here. Um, so we're reducing insecticide sprays from upwards of 25 to 75 percent. Sorry, we're reducing. 2013, no significant difference. 2014, no significant difference. So what we see here is that our IPM CPR using border sprays as a tactic for controlling our cat facing insects, specifically brown marmorate stink bug, is resulting in equal, if not slightly lesser levels of injury than our standard programs. However, we're only spraying the edge. We're not spraying the interior at all throughout the growing season. So we wanted to make sure when we looked at this damage that we looked at, we compared the edge to the interior to make sure that we were, weren't kind of artificially enhancing populations along the interior of the orchards. And I hope you can see here that populations, or at least damage, is still higher along the edge, um, but we're not increasing our, our damage at all along the interior. So integrating this behaviorally based tactic of just spraying the border edge is resulting in block level uh, control. And we did this on anywhere from five to 12 acres of farm. So much, this is at a commercial level, commercial scale. 
And not surprisingly, we use significantly less insecticide when we look at it in terms of kilograms per AI. Kilograms AI per acre, sorry. So back to our systems level approach. We, I feel that we were able to successfully manage an arthropod pest, and not just one. So coming back to the systems level approach, we're managing native, native stink bugs, brown marmorain stink bug, uh, ligus, our moth pests, and we're hoping to see some impact on our secondary pests as well. We're significantly reducing our amount of insecticide that we're applying, therefore we're reducing our environmental impact. But what about our beneficial insect services? So those would be our pollinators and our predator species. So the question then becomes, does this management program does, that we've already developed, this IPM-CPR tactic, does it also help to conserve our beneficial insect species? So if you look at a traditional orchard, this is actually from Virginia, I believe. Um, we can see we have our nice apple trees here, and we have our row middle, or our ground cover. And within that ground cover, what do we see a lot of? We see a lot of flowers. And flowers are good for not only our ligus, um, but they're also good for our bee species. So we have our native bees, uh, specifically helictids here, that forage on the, on the clover and any other flowering resources that they have within the orchard. But they don't limit it just to that. Although peaches are not insect pollinated per se, we do have um, bees, this, here's a bumblebee, uh, visiting our flowers during bloom. And peaches also have extra floral nectaries that the, our pollinators will feed on uh, throughout the growing season. So we wanted to know, does this tactic also, double slide, um, does this IPM CPR tactic also help to support our bee species? So in one of our research plots, we applied a stinger herbicide to half the plot. So stinger, no stinger, no stinger, stinger. Um, and then we sampled bees within the ground cover. And then this year, we also sampled bees within the orchard canopy. Uh, this was done with visual observations as well as sweep net samples to collect the bees. And now that we have all these bees in the freezer, and I have to learn how to identify bees, we're going to run some ELISAs to also look at insecticide levels on not only the flowers, but also on the bees themselves. So did it work? Well, where there's flowers within the ground cover, there's bees. Not surprising, right? Um, but it's kind of nice when it works out. Um, but do we actually get um, in? Within the trees, we also we didn't see a significant effect, but we did see um, this is only last year's data. We did see a higher, lower numbers of bees foraging within the orchard, within the trees, um, in the plots that have been treated with herbicide. So what that means is that we did have primarily white clover um, as our dominant weed species, and we found mostly helicted bees or the sweat bees that were foraging within our orchard. So it seems a little counterintuitive. Um, to use an herbicide to protect bees. And I know we're removing a floral resource from those bees, but our thinking here is that if we can remove a floral resource that is contaminated with either a fungicide or an insecticide that could be toxic to the bees or at least have some su sort of sublethal effects, then this can work as a conservation tactic uh, for the bees. Now, in an ideal world, in a true systems level ecology, we would want to also provide an alternative safe pollinator habitat for those foraging bees to kind of replace that resource. Um, so in, in terms of natural enemies, this is the other side of it, when we looked at our IPM CPR blocks uh, when, with a redundancy analysis, what we see is significantly higher numbers of our primary predator species, um, coccinellids, spiders, serfids, parasitoids, within our IPM CPR blocks than we do with our standard. Um, and there's no effect on the interior or the edge, per se, but it does seem to be a richer community within our IPM CPR block, so it looks like we're helping to conserve our natural enemy community as well. Now, we also put sentinel egg masses for BMSB, um, both on the edge and in the interior of the block. In one year, we saw a significant increase in the number of, um, in the level of predation on those eggs. We didn't see that effect significant in the second year, of course, um, but we do see a strong numerical increase. So what I think we can say here is that this IPM CPR tactic not only exploits the behavioral ecology of multiple pests within the peach agroecosystem, um, but we're also enhancing our natural enemy services through reduced insecticide inputs. Now this year we did the same thing for our oriental fruit moth eggs, um, but we're still crunching 
that data. Um, and this is actually the first um, commercial management trial that we've seen for, at least in orchards, for brown marmorite stink bugs. So we're able to manage a, a invasive species um, through reduced inputs. Now, I mentioned that we have natural enemies, but this is an invasive species. Now, the enemy release hypothesis is frequently cited as a reason for the success of invaders. When an invasive species comes, arrives here, it arrives so here without its co-evolved cohort of natural enemies. And in escape of that, it allows um, you know, high population growth. Okay? Hasn't been proven as well um, for invasive insects as it has been for our plant invasive plant community. Um, and there's some, there's some exam um, exceptions to this rule. But essentially, we're trying to determine if natural enemies are important regulators of this novel resource. Now, some work done here um, by Koppel et al. found within our native species of stink bugs in row crops, we had pretty high levels of parasitism, um, 26, I think, to 88% parasitized uh, egg masses, but very little predation. Now, with brown marmorate stink bug, we're almost seeing the opposite of that. So as part of a multi-state trial through an OREI project, we put sentinel egg masses out for 48 hours at all these different locations on organic farms. And that's where we are in New Jersey. Take up that much room. So over two years, uh, we put sentinel egg masses out, and we see very variable, highly variable levels of predation and parasitism. Very low levels of parasitism. Uh, that would be the purple number here. So it averaged about. 1% at the maximum levels of uh, parasitism. Now, that's by our native parasitoid species. Um, in 2014, we actually started counting the number of unemerged parasitoids. This is the theory has been that these are aborted eggs of the uh, native parasitoid. They're laying eggs in Haliomorpha because it's a very abundant resource, um, but they're unable to develop due to host uh, immune response. Um, but we do have about on average, 21% predation on the egg masses and 15% predation. Um, however, these are in organic farms, which there's been a lot of research that shows that they, ought to, that they do tend to have a higher level of um, at least a more diverse natural enemy community. We also put a portion of these, stink, uh, these egg masses under night vision cameras for 48 hours, and we found some interesting predators. Um, the birds would just come in and eat the entire egg mass. Um, they're attracted to the white board that we had here. So we removed those from the data set. But what we did find that was really interesting was that katydids would also consume the entire egg mass, and it would just be counted normally as a missing egg mass. So my grad student, John Pote, uh, has taken some of these key predators and put them in kind of semi-field uh, cages, uh, exposing multiple life stages of BMSB to our native predator species. And we can find overall, to quickly summarize that data set, our damsel bugs or our nabids were consuming our second instars. There it's consuming a uh, fourth instar out in the field. Um, our reguvids were feeding on the first instars as they, as they stayed aggregated around the egg mass. Katydids preferred the egg stage, in fact, did nothing to the other life stages. Um, and our coccinellids, although it wasn't significant in the, in the lab, um, did seem to prefer to feed on the second instars. So that's great. We know that our egg predation goes from 15 to 20%, which is a lot higher than we would normally expect for an invasive species. But if you look at our um, egg, our, the distribution of our stink bug eggs within our agroecosystem, they're much higher than our native stink bug species. We also have evidence that they are feeding, or at least have the potential to feed, on multiple life stages. So we have our predator system that looks to seem like it might be adapting to this novel resource. So we've done some uh, gut content analysis of predators within our system. We have a 90 base pair uh, ITS region of DNA that we are using qPCR on. This allows us to detect BMSB DNA for a minimum of 48 hours, even up to 72 hours. And I know this is a lot of information on here, but we're getting on average 14% of these predators are showing up positive, which means within approximately 48 hours, 14% of the predators that we've sampled are positive for BMSB. They've consumed some sort of life stage of BMSB. Now, the key predator taxa are coccinellids, which in the lab didn't really do much. Um, so that was kind of surprising, including things like um, Colimigelia maculata uh, had some 
feeding. These numbers above them are the number that we've actually analyzed through gut content analysis. So we've done a lot of harmonia here. Um, our NABIDs are showing up as pretty positive. Um, I think we have about 35% and we've tested 35 predator species. And our Tetagoneids specifically, our Katydids are also positive. Now, some surprising ones are Cantharids, where we had a couple positive Cantharids or soldier beetles that were positive. I don't know why. Hi, buddy. Um, but we also aren't finding any Chrysopids that are positive. Um, and we're finding earwigs or Dermaptera that are also positive. So we're getting some surprising predators. Um, these aren't necessarily ones that are completely unique, but they're ones that weren't even showing up when we did our uh, video data. So we still have about 1,500 predators to go through, though. Um, we sampled over 2,000. So our IPM CPR has reintroduced our IPM tactics into the agroecosystem here. And when we apply a biofix model, um, we know that they're migrating into peaches really early. And we can use this behaviorally based management system to not only reduce, I, reduce the amount of insecticide that we're using, we can conserve our natural enemies and hopefully bring our IPM tactics back. Now, I think I have enough time to go through the second approach that we've taken. Um, are there any questions so far? I can, no, okay. I know I talk a little fast. I'm from Jersey. Um, so I would say, I hope you agree here that our um, IPM CPR approach is protecting, is tackling all three of these parts of a systems level approach. Multiple pest species, reducing uh, environmental impacts, and prov uh, protecting our beneficial insect services. However, this is a landscape level pest. So can we develop a management program that exploits behavioral ecology as well? So the same question that we asked earlier. Now, the approach that we decided to take through an OREI grant was the use of trap crops. So trap crops are where you plant, a, uh, you plant plants um, that are supposed to be more attractive to, um, to an insect pest than the cash crop. So this is specifically, we're hoping to attract them at a specific phenological stage of the crop, and it's assuming preference. Um, so the idea here is, th the main question is that stink bugs are polyphagous. We know brown murmurate stink bug alone has over 150 host plants. Is something like a trap crop going to actually be effective against a landscape level, highly mobile pest? The nymphs move, the adults move, um, and where trap crops have been used, they've also failed more times than they've succeeded. The reason we went through this is because our growers, our organic growers that were collaborators on this grant, really wanted to test them. And I was like, it ain't going to work. But we can try it. Now, one of the reasons that it's been suggested that trap crops have failed is due to a lack of retention on that trap crop, meaning the trap crop attracts them really well, but then they just disperse into the cash crop. Now, trap crops have been used for stink bugs before. Um, it takes advantage of their landscape ecology, host plant selection, dispersal behavior. Um, it's been effective for um, Nazara in soybeans. Sorghum's been effective for Nazara in cotton. White mustard and pea have also been effective for Nazara. See, again, you're getting the, ooh, that was fun. Um, you're getting an idea here of the high polyphagy nature of stink bugs in general, um, and then uh, Russ Mizell in Florida looked at multiple host, multiple trap crops for stink bugs. Um, so can this work for Halliomorpha? We have an invasive species, but we also thought we might as well try to attract our native stink bugs as well, because in vegetable systems, even though I'm not a vegetable entomologist, my understanding is that you you know the native stink bugs are also a problem here as well. So we initially did a study where we compared four different trap crops. Sorghum, sunflower, okra, um, also a really good host plant for Halimorpha, and pearl millet. Um, we did this in a randomized um, a Latin square design at four different research stations. And what we saw was that sunflower and sorghum were the most preferred host plants. Um, but BMSB, not, not surprisingly, was tracking plant phenology with the seed head uh, being the most attractive phase. Now, for our native stink bugs, they were highly attracted during the flowering stage as well as the seed head stage. And part of this floral stage was due to the high attraction of sunflower to our native Eushista species. Did you have a question or just stretching? Okay. So in collaboration with organic growers at in eight different locations throughout the mid-Atlantic states, um, down to Tennessee, 
in North Carolina, uh, we did a on-field tri infield trial where we have peppers uh, planted on black plastic standard practices surrounded by a polyculture with sunflower and sorghum on the outside. So this is an entire solid perimeter of trap crop. Um, and it's probably not the system I would recommend going forward, um, but it allowed a lot of replication over um, periods of time. Now, sorghum is highly attractive to brown marmorite -right stink bug. If you notice, this adult actually also has a tachinid egg on its head. Um, our native stink bugs are highly attracted to sunflower specifically. Um, and we also get a lot of natural enemies and, and beneficial insects with the sunflower specifically. So does it work? Uh, this, is research, this is data taken from New Jersey. Um, we can see populations of BMSB on our trap crop hot, early in the season. Um, and relative to the pepper, um, it stays a little higher. Um, but that's just for um, our visual sampling. Now, in terms of injury, the untreated control is, is a pepper stand without a trap crop. We, it looks like it's highly significant, um, but then later in the season, it kind of falls apart. Our natural enemies also kind of track this with much higher populations on the trap crops than on the um, peppers. Now, what was interesting is that our highly diversified organic farm um, collaborator, the trap crop peppers also seem to track have higher levels of natural enemies than the peppers without a trap crop. So it seems like the natural enemies might be tracking the, um, the, the sunflower specifically and maybe spilling over into the pepper plants. So when we look at our multi-state trial, uh, multiple two years, eight farms, big mess of data. Doug participated in this as well. His data wasn't messy. It was all probably mine. Um, what we see is that overall, our damage is not significant. Um, this is the control peppers and this is the trap crop, but we do see, sig uh, we do see numerically less damage in our trap crop peppers uh, than our control. Now, we divided our categories into minor damage with just one or two spots of stink bug feeding or major damage. Major damage is a really damaged pepper, so all that white spot is stink bug feeding. Uh, it worked significantly for our minor damage did not work for major damage. Um, so basically what happened is where you had really, really high levels of brown marmorite stink bug, they just <coughs> spilled over into the peppers is what happened. Um, but it does seem to work for minor damage. Whether or not this would be economic for organic grower is still questionable. And I think that what we need to do is refine the, the spatial arrangement of the trap crops um, to, to increase the area that that's attractive to. But we know we have attractive um, potential trap crops. We just need to better manipulate the spatial arrangement. So if you remember, I talked, I said that one of the main reasons that trap crops failed, which they do frequently, is the, that they can't retain the pest of, in focus. So we wanted to look at this. So we again used, this is Brett Blau spraying egg protein on our trap crop. Um, and then we did milk on the interior. And we combined that with harmonic radar of the nymphs, and this was work done, led by Tracy Lesky and Rob Morrison at USDA. So nymphs were released within both the trap crop and the pepper, and were tracked for seven days. We did, um, at the same time, we did protein marking and sampled for seven days. So visually, uh, equal numbers were observed during visual sampling between the trap crop and the peppers, but when we did our, our shake samples for um, for the protein marker collection, we did see significantly higher numbers of BMSB in the trap crop, as would be expected. Um, so they're coming to the trap crop, and we have a good sample size. Now, the results of the protein marker, remember, egg was sprayed in the trap crop and the milk in the peppers. Uh, what we see here is that within the peppers, or our cash crop, we see no eggs. No, none of the, the peppers were marked only with eggs. Um, that's not unsurprising. We had a significantly higher number of the bugs that were collected in pepper marked with milk, which is what they were sprayed with. Um, and we did see some that were marked with both. Now on the flip side, on the trap crop, we see very high levels. 80% of the bugs that were captured were marked only with egg, which means they stayed on egg. On, on egg. They stayed on the trap crop. Um, none were marked only with milk, 
um, which means they didn't just move there. And then we saw a few that were double marked. This double marked ones indicates movement back and forth. It was only 6% of our samples. Um, so very minimal levels of movement between the, the peppers and the trap crops or the trap crops and the peppers. So it suggests here that there's a higher retention of trap crops uh, than the peppers. And this was done at two, two research farms. Now the harmonic radar results are similar. This was done at three phenological periods. And what we see here, we have retention time, uh, and we have higher levels of retention time at all three time periods um, than we saw in the peppers, which means that they're staying on the trap crop for longer periods of time than they are in the peppers. And when we look at the distance moved, uh, what we see is that it's the flip side. The ones that were released in pepper moved the farthest. Um, at two significant at two different time points, and then the ones in the trap crops didn't move as much. So what we what we think that this means is that based when we combine both of these results, uh, what is that the bugs are moving to the trap crop and they're staying there. We get a little bit of back and forth movement between the two, and some of that back and forth movement is likely, at least based on the harmonic radar evidence, the bugs that are in the peppers are moving to the trap crop. Um, so we think that this is a highly effective system um, and that the trap crop is in fact retaining brown marmorite stink bug over the week period that we, the one week period that we looked at this, even though we did this multiple times of the year. Now is a week sufficient for organic management? I don't know. Um, that's up to the individual grower. We have looked at management tactics. Uh, insect, organic insecticides are moderately effective. Flaming unfortunately was the most effective, but then that's destroying our natural enemies. So. That systems level impact, again, you have to bring a lot of different players into the system. So what we know so far is that we have a landscape level pest that we can't just use one hammer against. We have to use multiple hammers, multiple management tactics to successfully control this invasive species, at least until Trisulcus japonicus you know, distributes evenly and it can, controls uh, brown marmorade by itself. So when we look at this, we can look at the behavior cues uh, in, that we get from a species behavioral ecology and to see what makes it a successful invader, the ability to spread, the ability to adapt to envi its environment, um, impact of natural enemies, um, host plant relationships, sorry, and kind of use those against it, exploit those same behaviors for management tactics. Um, through these, we've uh, demonstrated significant reduction in our heavily managed peach system. We've identified predators, specifically not your common predators, like uh, katydids, for instance, of Haliomorpha, and we've developed a trap cropping system for organic farms, and this is better than any other system that they had had to date. So have we succeeded in developing systems level approaches for Haliomorpha? Well, in at least two cropping systems, we've managed multiple arthropod pests, reduced our environmental impact, and hopefully protected our beneficial insect services. So. With that, if we have time, I'll take any questions. Anyone? I'm just curious what it's like in China. Is it mm -hmm. balanced or is it a pest? Do they have to manage it? It's an outbreak pest in China. So they have a different arsenal of chemicals that they can use, um, but their main pest is a different stink bug species. Haliomorpha is an outbreak species. It's predominantly controlled by Trisulcus japonicus. Um, there's average level of 50% predation on egg masses that they find within peaches with upwards of 90%. So they, that co-evolved relationship between parasitoid and pest uh, really is effective. It's just when that gets a little off kilter that the MSB explodes over there. So when you mean outbreak, it's triggered by Yes, they think it's due to um, Japanese cedar cone production, they think uh, is a main driver of population outbreaks. So, but like most invasive species, there was almost no literature available when we started on this pest. Um, yeah. What's the status of the Japonicus uh, parasitoid? I know it was being studied in quarantine, but then it was found from some type of accidental introduction. Right, so, so Japonicus uh, has been studied in quarantine labs at multiple locations in the US for five years, um, but it also, 
Sorry, my kids are scooting up to the front. You can sit up there, buddy. Um, but it has also been detected in Washington, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and now New York. Um, however, when they did some microsatellite analysis, that was it was a very geographically distinct population, uh, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, from those that are in quarantine. So the USDA folks swear that they didn't release them. <laughs> Um, but we are we cannot release those that have been found across state lines because it is still under quarantine. So we still have to go through federal permits to um, for for release. Is there a hold up follow up? Is there a, like a hold up? A, a host range testing uh, still ongoing or? So my understanding is that there is still a lot of host range testing going on. Unfortunately. Uh, Japonicus is a polyphagous species. It will also attack our native um, pentatomids, including Podiasis maculoventris, which is a the spine soldier bug, is a predatory species. So, the questions are whether or not it prefers those in the field. We haven't been able to do um, in field testing because we, there's no permits for that yet. But in the lab, it will it will attack other ones. The the preference still remains for BMSB, um, but there is non-target parasitism. So it's not an ideal candidate. Um, but the fact that it's already here may help. Um, so obviously someone's, there are folks studying these new accidental introduction populations. Yes, yeah. Um, and. What's interesting so far, at least what I think is interesting, is that Japonicus has not been found in agricultural crops. The, all the detections, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but have been in forested systems uh, along the wood edge. So it doesn't look like it's moving out of that ecosystem yet. So we don't know what impact it would have on the population um, if it remains in the wood edge. So, But our population model actually shows that there's a lot more going on in terms of population growth early in the season before we see it in, in our cropping systems. So it's possible, um, at least if the, if the model is correct, um, that a fair amount of egg production could occur in those wood edges, because we can't find them anywhere. I mean, I've been up in bucket trucks looking for them, um, which was a, a fun day. You have a question, James? Can you find an egg on the egg masses in the field crops, or are mainly in forest there? Mostly in ornamental settings, yeah. So we get, in our peach system, um, we get very, very low levels of parasitism. Um, and even with all those organic crops in peppers and such, it was still really low. Yeah? The, the intrastate movement mm -hmm. is regulated by APHIS. Right. Are any of the departments of agriculture within the states being involved in that? I don't know. Um, not that I know of. I know in New Jersey, our biocontrol lab is waiting. They're, they're just waiting to test it. Um, but we haven't detected it in New Jersey yet. So I don't know about the in intrastate um, dispersal of Japonicus. Yeah, that's interesting. Another question I had was on, on the trap crops. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at the retention uh, or whatever it is in the trap. Uh, regarding on peppers, it, and maybe I missed it. If the trap crop wasn't there at all, mm -hmm. would you have more or less? I mean, I, I didn't see that in the treatment. We had peppers that were not with the trap crop. That was our that was our untreated control, our standard. Okay, so that was your yeah, and so it was that that was our big question: is are we bringing more to the peppers in the first place with this tra trap crop than would normally be there? Um, and we were hoping that. That the combination of the protein markers and the harmonic radar will show us if the trap crops are actually acting as a population sink source, um, but <laughs> it, it wasn't. We weren't able to tease that out of the information. So it, it's a tricky question, um, and it's definitely one we've we've thought of. Um, but I think it has potential. Um, we've looked at adding aggregation pheromone traps to the trap crop to try and. I don't want to say trap out because that's not the correct term, but essentially physically remove some of the bugs, and honestly, it didn't work. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm very much still on the fence about trap crops. Um, 
I think that they show a lot of potential. I think, honestly, if I were an organic farmer and wanted to use them, I would plant them along my wood edge where they're first coming in and use some sort of management tactic within there to control them um, and, and hope to kind of trap them out that way, whether through flaming them or in, uh, organic insecticide or even just high doses of fer um, aggregation pheromone as like an attracting kill type of thing. Um, but we, we have more funding to look at this, so I think that's one of the questions we're going to, or some people are at least, are going to look at. Ah, yeah, so harmonic radar uses a, a copper wire anode, something, copper wire that's glued to the prothorax, um, and it stays there for a fair amount, over a week, um, and is very strong, and they use this big kind of satellite dish that they just kind of take around the farm, and, and when they're close to it, it beeps, and then they can go and find it, um, so they record the location of each one of those. Um, it's been used for plum curculio and apples, and they've been using it for stink bug as well. Um, no, it's not. Do you guys know? I I don't know what the detection distance is of harmonic radar, but it's the detection distance of harmonic radar. It's it's not super short. Um, I want to say it's like 100 meters or so. Yeah, that's, that um, to it. yeah, I just keep picturing Dew oh. running after it with Gangnam yeah. Style playing in the background. But um, about the distance of a football field. it was it's about that. Yeah, so it, it's not yeah. on the farmscape level. It's not huge, <laughs> or at least on the landscape level. But between crop movement, we can detect it. So, you know, each each tool we have has its positives and its drawbacks. Boys, it's done. You would pay for a five-year-old and not a 16-year-old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom. So, yeah, that whole movement uh, back and forth in the trap crop and all that, I, I got lost a little bit with whether it's the same for adults and nymphs, and then with the nymphs, was there issues with, the, with them molting, and then they would use <laughs> the protein marker? So they do that. Uh, the nymphs do definitely molt. Um, we're hoping within the week period that we did we had minimal molting. Um, we combined both our nymphs and our adults in the sample. Um, we did, oh, I'm trying to remember. Um, we just got it back from review. Um, I believe we did find the equal numbers and that this pattern was the same between adults and nymphs. Um, but we, you do lose some with the nymphs molting, but you lose some with the adults flying away. Right. So. We've used protein marking a lot, um, and in some ways it has a, a lot of benefits over fluorescent, fluorescent marking, um, but it's a pretty expensive assay, and you have to rely on natural, um, natural populations for it to work. Mm -hmm. So you can't just do these mass releases. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I Thank you very much. Wanna, uh, yeah, thank you.